My part in the battle was, as you've heard, to serve on the world's first operational escort carrier, HMS Audacity, on convoy protection duty between Liverpool and Gibraltar from September 1941 until sunk in the Bay of Biscay on December the 21st. Well, in that four months, we had incredible success. We managed to destroy five of the four engine condors, and we managed to be responsible for the destruction of five U-boats. Now, Winston Churchill at this time had had the idea that Atlantic convoys required more protection they were getting merely by surface escorts and they didn't have air cover once they got outside the range of um, aircraft operating from the UK or operating from America so there was a huge gap in the middle with no air cover at all and his idea was to have small aircraft carriers do this job and there were the name Woolworth Carrier became part of the thing because later on they were built in huge numbers. But the Audacity was really the first of those. And in this case, all they did was literally slice the top off the ship, put a flight deck on it, <clears throat> a very small flight deck, and it really was a merchant ship with a, a steel deck on it and um, a few RN crew and the main bulk of the crew were, in fact, much Navy seamen. Of course, it was a difficult ship to fly from because the flight deck was only 420 feet long, which is extremely small, and the beam was, flight deck beam was only 60 feet. So you were flying from a, really a very, very small MIDI carrier. And uh, again, it had no hangar, no aircraft hangar as such, so all the aircraft were up on the flight deck. And this made it a very, very tough business for the maintenance personnel who had to do everything on the flight deck. Yes, it was OG-76, and, and the, the major battle was HG-76, coming home from Gibraltar. Well, we primarily we did two things. Uh, we did anti-submarine patrol, which isn't really a fighter's job, but it, um, we had to, because that's all, these were the only type of aircraft we had. We did a, a dawn patrol around the convoy, first thing, just to see that... Um, the area was clear of U-boats, and we did one last thing at night, dusk patrol. So these were the two anti-submarine patrols. Then during the day, 
we were at immediate readiness for takeoff against the Focke Wolf courier aircraft, which were raiders really against convoys, but in the main, of course, they were providing information to to the um, U-boat wolf packs, which were frequenting the Atlantic. So they were very, very dangerous aircraft from our point of view. They were also very heavily armed, extremely heavily armed. So they were not an easy um, target to fight against. An Atlantic raider with a speed of about 270 and a range of some 2,500 miles, the Fogger Wolf Condor, or Courier as she is popularly called, is an adaptation of the old peacetime four-engined airliner. <clears throat> Our 74 was much quieter in the sense that we only had um, one uh, courier attack during that convoy. It was a nasty attack. It, we had a rescue a hospital ship called the Walmer Castle. And we also had a rescue tug called the Thames. And we'd had some U-boat activity the night before, which um, caused one or two sinkings. And the Walmer Castle and the Thames were... had left the convoy looking for survivors to pick them up. In fact, they had picked up some badly hurt survivors when this uh, courier came in and attacked them. <clears throat> now, this was very bad because the Walmer Castle clearly, very clearly, had a huge red cross painted on its upper deck. And, um, but nevertheless, she was bombed by the courier and indeed uh, set on fire and the ship was lost with uh, most of the wounded people aboard, um, or many of the wounded people aboard before some of them were rescued, but some not. And just after she had released her bombs, uh, our two wildcats, a section of wildcats, well, I wasn't in the section, but the two of them came in and killed it off. So um, that was uh, our first occurrence. Every one of us, we talked about it all, every minute of the, or every hour of the day, practically, yes. We exchanged views, we exchanged tactics on what we would do if it happened, and we, because we were trying to cover ourselves as much as possible with our minimal experience, we were trying to find it amongst ourselves. And uh, we used to quiz the CEO all the time before he was killed. And then when he was killed, we reflected very, very deeply on that. I would say that was the one time when we, we didn't brood, but we reflected very deeply on what uh, the odds were and um, what our, whether our tactics were right. Solid nose and step for cockpit. Long tapered fuselage, broken by gun turret and gun position on top. And gondola below. High thimble-shaped fin and rudder, and unlike most large British bombers, no tail gun turret. Now we're beginning to know something about her. There had been an attack on a courier by the commanding officer and his um, number two, and he was killed in this attack. So we lost our CO on the, on the way out. He had made a successful attack, set the aircraft on fire, and unfortunately, instead of breaking away totally, his number two said that he came in and more or less to have a look at uh, whether the thing was actually um, finished or not. He came too close, it got within range of the gunner. 
gunners, the upper dorsal gunner started opening fire, so he immediately banked away to uh, get out of uh, range, but he was hit on the belly of the aircraft just as he banked away. The Courier was probably the most heavily armed German aircraft in the sky. It had machine guns firing out the side windows, cannon, two turrets on top, and a complete gondola underneath. All told, it was very heavily armed. Realizing what I was up against, I had studied this very carefully. worked out how the guns could depress or elevate. There was only one black spot which they couldn't reach, and that was if you came in flat towards the pilot's cockpit. This was out, and um, we were about... In the Bay of Biscay, I suppose six to eight hundred miles due west of Brest, roughly. Well, and the first time we <clears throat> spotted two of these, and my section leader was the one that caught sight of them first, and he called, and um, he assigned one to me, and he went off to take the other. And I chased mine, and we knew that the main weakness on the courier was that it had a rather weak tail unit. That, that is to say, on landing, for example, if you made a heavy landing, you could actually snap the fuselage near the tail. So this was a weak point we knew about from intelligence reports. And we'd already had one success with a section actually firing at the tail unit and breaking it off. Um, so this was the point we tended to aim for at first. But I found this uh, difficult in the sense that when I was uh, against this particular courier, he was flying below a fairly low cloud base, just below it. And therefore you had to come in very flat and you had no real chance to break away above them or you had to break away below which of course is the more desirable way to go but um, with the, the visibility etc we were only getting in and I was only getting in a one or a two second burst at a time but on one of these bursts I did set one of his inner engines on fire and um, of course four engine aircraft and he popped up into the cloud, and that, so I thought I'd lost him completely. It was a fairly thin cloud layer, possibly about 400 feet. So I went above it, and hopefully just that I might see him, um, that he might pop through it, but he didn't. So, and I was just milling around, generally hoping that something would happen, when I saw a wingtip just come out of the cloud. He was obviously turning. So I knew he was turning, and I, on that basis I thought I would reverse course with him, but I, some, I didn't get it quite right, because when eventually he did emerge, I found I was actually head on to him. And it was the only chance I was going to get. So I came down fairly flat, because they had, I'd realized that the top gun he had, the dorsal gun, it was a cannon actually, couldn't be depressed below a certain um, elevation. And um, if you kept very flat, he probably wouldn't be able to fire at you. So I came in, and uh, the main risk at that stage is you have a very high relative closing speed, and there is a great risk of collision. So you've got a very, very short firing time. But after all, we had four... 0.5 inch machine guns which is quite a heavy um, armament and um, I just blasted away as I came in in the two or three seconds and I could actually see the cockpit um, glass shattering and uh, before I pulled away 
And um, then it just spiraled down into the sea. That was on one convoy um, going out to Gibraltar. This was one of the this was one of the most heavily attacked convoys of World War Two. In fact, in that convoy, which the Commodore was the famous Captain Walker, um, we had tremendous success. Um, a considerable number of U boats were indeed sunk. And U-boat sightings were quite frequent, um, quite often on the surface, because <clears throat> when we did these patrols, they were quite wide out beyond, the, we were circling the convoy, but they're quite a distance from the convoy. And the U-boats were surfaced at, <clears throat> at that distance in order to have the maximum closing speed to, um, to get close into the convoy, because once they go under, of course, their speed reduces. And uh, so in the evening in particular, it was quite common to catch them on the surface. And all we could do, we could attack with our guns, but uh, we weren't really going to sink a submarine with 0.5-inch machine guns. Uh, but at least we made them keep their heads down and usually caused them to dive. And But the main thing we were doing was we were reporting all this back to to the convoy um, commodore who was um, directing the whole thing. And he could then direct his uh, anti-submarine destroyers or corvettes to the scene knowing that he'd had a positive sighting. And in fact, we lost one of our Wildcats to a U-boat. Uh, one of the Wildcats spotted a U-boat on the surface and attacked him, and the U-boat shot it down. So we lost one that way, but I personally didn't see it. It was seen by some of the escort vessels. It was a bit out away from the carrier, but one of the escort vessels who recovered his body, uh, I think it was Walker's own ship, covered his, recovered the pilot's body. And on the way back, um, I had another one, and he was, this time, the, I had more chance to set myself up with him. Uh, he couldn't escape into cloud as easily, so what I did was actually, uh, having found that the head-on attack was very, very um, successful, we had discussed this within the squadron after that particular combat, and we decided that this was a technique we would try and latch onto, because it was one way of avoiding um, too many guns being brought to bear on you. So this time I set up the head-on attack from the word go, and it it worked out very well indeed, worked out beautifully, and um, it went the same way as the first one, really. It was, it was much more straightforward because I didn't have a cloud chase this time. It becomes rather like a, a jousting event in the, with the knights of old. I think you, you know, you suddenly lose all worry and fear and trepidation about the whole thing. Get on with it. And your feelings when you see the enemy plane go down. You inevitably think of the people who have lost their lives, inevitably. I think not immediately. I think immediately that happens, you're filled with elation that you've won the contest. But I think maybe in the evening you sit and reflect on it and you think that's somebody's, some mother's son or some child's father. And you think of these things. 
But you have to put them at the back of your mind, because if you conduct a war on the basis of emotion, you're never going to get anywhere. But they do cross your mind, inevitably.